All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Hi, welcome to Parent University. Um, today we are presenting helmets and car seats and pools. Oh my, it's gonna be a very fascinating and informative session today. As you know, we have Parent University basically address the topics that you guys are interested in. So if you have any topics or suggestions, please let us know. But I'm not gonna say anything else because right now we have a lot to cover. And today our presenters are Dr. Sophia Chandri and Dr. Manisha Agwa. And they're gonna go over once again, helmets and car seats and pools Oh my, pearls to keep your elementary students, kids safe from major injuries. So I'm going to take it over to you guys. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I'm Manisha Agarwal. Oh, and I cannot share my screen yet. I think, Katrina, while you're sharing, there we go. Um, I am going to share our talk. And we're so excited to be here and to share some information with you. Um, Dr. Chaudhry and I are pediatric emergency medicine physicians with Emory and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And the reason why we're so passionate about this topic is because prevent, let me, prevent, preventable injuries are the leading cause of death in children here in the United States. So this is actually a really, really big issue. It's actually the leading cause of death for Americans up to the age of 44. Uh, but when you really drill down on the ages served at Mary Lynn in 2020, where we had the most recent CDC data, we know that there were 3,192 children who died in that year. 30% of those deaths were due to unintentional injuries, and another 10% of those deaths were due to homicide and suicide. When you drill down a little bit more, we know that the leading cause of unintentional injury nationally is car crashes. Uh, followed by drowning. But as Dr. Chaudhry will get into, firearms are also implicated in these deaths and actually were responsible for 195 child, children's deaths uh, in the five to 11 year old age range back in 2020. But we have to remember that deaths are just the tip of the iceberg. For every child that dies, there are 27 children who are hospitalized, about another thousand more that require treatment in an emergency department, and many, many more who require treatment at the nurse's office at the school, at doctor's offices, or who may never come to formal medical attention. And yes, some injuries are going to be fatal, but some injuries might still result in children having life altering disabilities that alter what their lives look at, look like after that injury. And injuries can be minor and some are gonna happen in the course of normal childhood development, like a toddler learning how to walk. But there are many instances where we can take measures to reduce the risk of injury or the severity of injury, like using stair gates at the top and bottom of stairs to prevent the toddler who's learning how to walk from tumbling down a bunch of stairs. And there are a lot of ways that children can sustain injuries. And so we can't really cover it all in an hour. Um, things like poisoning, button batteries, playground falls, ATVs. Um, but when we really think about what the leading causes of injury related death are in our age group that we serve at Mary Lynn, that really informs what we wanted to focus on, which is car crashes, firearms, helmets as it relates to bicycles and scootering, and drowning. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful colleague and friend, Dr. Chaudhry, um, to talk to you about drowning and firearms. Thanks so much, Manisha. So starting with drowning, a silent killer that can happen in a matter of seconds. That's really perhaps the most challenging aspect of drowning is that it's fast and so easy to miss. Next slide. So even though there's been an overall decline in the drowning death rates over the last 30 years, it still remains the leading cause of death for um, injury related death for children's ages one through four. And this concludes toddlers with the highest fatality seen amongst 12 to 36 month olds typically from lack of barriers and having unsupervised access to home hazards. So things like bathtubs, buckets, toilets, hot tubs, and pools. For children under age one, two thirds of the drownings were in bathtubs. And then 75% of the annual pool drownings in children under age five were actually due to them being in the pool when they weren't expected to be. Adolescents have our second highest drowning fatality rate. This is predominantly seen in black teens. Drowning in this age group is typically in natural bodies of water due to overconfidence and skills, high risk impulsive behavior, substance abuse, specifically alcohol, and lack of insight into environments that may be dangerous. 
And so, you know, I've, I've added this um, to kind of think about the two highest risk groups for drowning, um, but drowning actually does affect children of all ages, as Dr. Agarwal has pointed out. Next slide. Outside of age, other high-risk groups include all males over age one. For race, Black children and teens have the highest overall drowning rate, followed by American Indian and Alaska Natives. And children with certain conditions, including epilepsy, so seizure disorders, autism, um, and ab abnormal heart rhythm, cardiac arrhythmias, are also at increased risk. There's a seasonality to drowning. So what we typically see is that more than 70% of pediatric drowning under age 15 actually occur between May and August. And that makes sense, right? So it's better weather, summer break, um, more children are in the pool. Most of these drownings occur on Saturdays and Sundays, late in the afternoon and or early evening, between the hours of four to six. Typically, um, when often many of us may be distracted, preparing dinner, um, getting the kids um, home from school. For swimming pool deaths, in general, white children are more likely to drown in a residential pool while black children are more likely to drown in a public pool, specifically hotels and motel pools. In fact, African-Americans between the ages of five to, nine, five to 19 are 5.5 more times likely to drown in a swimming pool than our white children of the same age. And this is thought to be from a number of potential factors, so poor swimming skills in both the children and parents, a lack of early training, lack of lifeguards at a motel or hotel pool um, are all sort of possible contributing factors. Next slide. So what can we do as parents to prevent drowning? The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends multiple layers of protection altogether for drowning prevention. So there are two types of overall protection um, in terms of general categories for drowning prevention. The first is protection from when kids are not supposed to be in the pool um, or in and around water. So barriers from preventing entrance. And the second is protection for when children are supposed to be in the water. So um, when they're either swimming or bathing. So starting with barriers, four-sided pool fencing is the most studied and most effective measure in young children that has been shown to prevent more than 50% of child pool drownings. You want your fences to be self-closing, self-latching, at least four feet tall, and should completely separate the house from the yard. Next slide. So when we're thinking about additional layers of protection, specifically when your child or teen is supposed to be within the water. Everyone on a boat or life or um, everyone on a boat or water vessel should wear a US Coast Guard approved life jacket. Life jackets should also be worn by young children or inexperienced swimmers when they're in and around water. Air filled swim aids, so things like armbands, neck rings and floaties are not actually recommended because they can deflate. Swim lessons should, can start as early as age after age one depending upon your child's individual circumstances. We know that lessons in ages one through four have been known to lower drowning rates. And these lessons should teach more than just basic swim skills. So water survival skills, such as swimming with your clothes on and life jackets in different environments. The child also should be taught to never swim alone. Parents should know how to swim or take lessons and know CPR. Children should be supervised constantly when in and around water. So that means never leaving a child alone with another child. Parents should be within arm's reach to allow for touch supervision in the younger child or inexperienced swimmer, and then within eyes reach or have constant eyes on the older, more competent swimmer. Having a designated water watcher, so an adult that is not distracted and is competent in CPR is also helpful. And then for open bodies of water, children should swim in areas where there is a lifeguard and in designated areas that are safe depending upon the weather current and tide. It's actually important to remember that a lifeguard really only offers one layer of protection and does not take the place of your supervision or the supervision or, or the place of the supervision of other caregivers that are watching your children. Next slide. One of the main messages that I hope to portray with, with this particular topic is that swim lessons in itself do not make your children drown proof and that the Actual aim and what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends is that our aim should be for all children and teens to be water competent. And that consists of three separate parts. So the first is having basic swim skills. So that's your ability to enter water, surface, turn around, float, tread, and exit. And then in addition to being able to go the distance of 25 yards, so sort of um, uh, two laps, uh, 
uh, two sort of back and forth distances across the pool. And then secondly, your child should have water safety awareness, which includes knowing your limitations, being aware of hazards, knowing how to put on a life jacket and wear a life jacket. And lastly, have the ability to recognize and respond to other swimmers that are in distress. Next slide. This next diagram here is just illustrating the drowning chain of survival. And it's a series of steps that we can intervene on at any point to reduce the drowning mortality, starting with prevention and providing care after rescue, with prevention being the most essential step. Additionally, early initiation of CPR is associated with better prognosis and overall survival. It's so important that as parents, um, we are competent in CPR, that we know um, that any additional caregivers, pool owners, and older children and teens that are um, in and around water, that they know CPR, um, it can actually make a huge difference in survival. Next slide. How can you support drowning prevention in your community? So supporting local policies to decrease drowning risks, such as fencing, life jackets, policies regarding boating under the influence, and emergency medical systems, and then collaborating with your local community groups to increase access to life jackets and water competency programs for all children, including those that are low income, children of diverse backgrounds, and those with developmental disabilities. Next slide. So Children's launched um, our first annual water safety, safety campaign back in 2019. And I put this slide up there just to sort of illustrate um, the variety of information and resources that we have available on our uh, general website that's listed here for Strong for Life. Um, so with the same messaging um, that's dictated by the American Academy of Pediatrics and keeping your child within arm's reach for those that cannot confidently swim two months of the pool at all times, um, and then the confident swimmers within eyes reach. Children's also teams up with YMCA every summer to offer free swim lessons. And then most recently, we started a campaign about it being never too late to learn how to swim and partnered with the former Falcons running back, um, Ido Smith, uh, where he, we documented his journey of learning how to swim at the age of 25. Next slide. So moving on to pediatric firearm injuries. Next slide. In 2019, for the first time, firearm injuries surpassed motor vehicle collisions as the leading cause of injury-related death in U.S. children ages 1 through 19. And it has unfortunately remained number one, um, even with the most recent CDC data um, released for, uh, for 2020. On average, seven children and teens zero through 17, and the cause of more than 2,200 deaths. A majority of these fatalities were homicide, followed by suicide, as the next highest group um, that you can see, with unintentional injuries making about 5%. Next slide. Highest risk factors for fire mortality include males being of the adolescent age group and living in low-income areas. Black children and teens are disproportionately affected and impacted and have the highest overall rate of firearm injury and death. They are 14 times more likely than white children and teens of the same age to die by gun homicide, while white children are more likely to die of firearm-related suicide. By geography, youth are, generally speaking, more likely to die by homicide um, in urban areas versus firearm-related suicide and unintentional injuries being more common in rural areas. Although I will say that in Georgia, we actually see a high rate of unintentional injuries related to firearms. So that basically means that a child's getting access to an unsecured firearm at home um, when they're not supposed to. Um, and we see, that we see that across our state and that's um, a very high percentage compared to other regions of the country. Next slide. In our state, firearms are the number one cause of pediatric death. And that has, just escalated uh, during the period of the pandemic. As more and more and more homes um, have access to, more and more homes have guns um, with the rise of gun sales over the past few years. 49% of Georgians own one or more gun and a gun is present in one in three homes with children. When gun owning parents in Metro Atlanta were asked, about 50% said that they do not store their gun locked and unloaded, which is the safest method for storage. 
and more than 20% said that they would trust their child with a loaded gun. And 75% actually believe that their child could distinguish between a real gun um, and a fake gun or a toy gun when only 40% could. Next slide. So one of the major risk factors for pediatric firearm injury related to unintentional injuries and firearm related suicide is having access to an improperly stored gun within the home. 4.6 million children in the US live in a home with at least one loaded and unlocked gun. 75% of kids, actually these are school age kids, know where a gun is stored within their home. And a child as young as three is strong enough to pull the trigger as research has shown. Playing with a gun is the most common circumstance for unintentional firearm injury related deaths. And so this can be anything from like an older child showing a gun to like a friend or a peer thinking that it's not loaded or thinking that the safety is engaged to a younger child mistaking a gun for a toy. In homes with firearms, the risks of unintentional death is four times higher for children than in homes without. Secondly, a majority of guns that are used in firearm related suicide are found in the home of a victim, family member, or close friend. The presence of a gun in the home increases the risk of suicide by two to five times, even if, you're, even if children do not have a prior history of a mental health crisis. Firearm related suicide is really different in children and teens as compared to adults. It's impulsive, it's not premeditated. Time to action is typically only a few minutes. Additionally, means matter. Firearm related suicides are fatal up to 90% of the time in comparison to 3% of um, suicides related to cutting or drugs. Next slide. One of the biggest messages that I hope to relay related to firearm safety is that we, can't gu we cannot gun proof our children, even those that have had gun safety training and that children are naturally curious about firearms, even when we may not think that our child would ever handle a gun. Prior research has shown this, and this one study that I put here on the left actually illustrates that. This was done at Emory um, some years ago where they had invited um, families that had boys that were eight to 12 years old to participate in this study, um, along with a playmate of the same age um, and or a sibling that was in the same age range. And the parents brought them to an outpatient clinic, um, put them in an exam room that had a one-way mirror um, and told their child that they would be right back and that they could play with anything in the room that was laid out, um, all the toys that were laid out, but they shouldn't go through um, anything else not to go into the cabinets and that they could leave at any time if they had questions. Um, outside of those toys that were easily accessible and visible, um, there actually were two water pistols, uh, toy water pistols, and then an actual handgun that was engineered not to fire that was concealed in a separate drawer. The handgun had a radio transmitter that activated a, a light whenever the trigger was depressed with sufficient force to actually discharge the firearm. And so the parents and researchers could see that light on their side of the room um, whenever, whenever the, the trigger was pulled. And then after the exercise, every boy was asked whether or not they thought the pistol was a real, real gun or a toy. Um, excuse me, if the handgun was a real gun or a toy. And then before leaving, every child was counseled about, counseled about safe behavior around guns. Ultimately, they watched these pairs for about 15 minutes. And what they found was within a 15 minute period, 72% of those boys found that handgun. 76% handled it and 48% actually pulled the trigger. So almost half of them pulled the trigger, sometimes pointing it at each other, sometimes pointing it at themselves, um, sometimes pointing it at the wall. About half of those boys could not tell the difference between a toy and a real gun. And the parental estimates of a child's interest in a gun did not predict the actual behavior on finding the handgun. Boys who were believed to have a low interest in guns were just as likely to handle the handgun or pull the trigger as, as the boys who were perceived to have a high or moderate interest in guns. And more than 90% of the children who handled the handgun or pulled the trigger reported that they had previously had some sort of gun safety instruction. Next slide. So what can we do? So our current recommendations for keeping children safe in the home around guns is that if there is a gun in the home, we recommend, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, to store all guns every time unloaded and locked and out of sight and out of reach, ideally in a lockbox or gun safe, and to keep the ammunition stored locked um, and stored separately from the gun. We know that about 41% of adolescents report having easy access to guns in their homes, and that 75% of elementary school children 
say that they know that where a gun is actually kept at home. And so this triple safe method reduces the risk of a child or a teen gaining access to the firearm. I would also not share any combination codes or the location of the key if you're using a key device. And then consider temporary offsite storage for a child or a teen that's going through um, a, a, like a mental health crisis. Next slide. Here are just some examples of types of safe storage devices that can be purchased um, and their cost. The most safe option would be in either a gun safe or a lockbox that would completely conceal the weapon. There are some options for lockboxes that provide quick access, such as a biometric or push button. Cable locks are an option. Um, they can be more cumbersome to remove. They're not considered as safe because you have to keep track of the key. Uh, all of these options would fit a handgun and a gun safe would be ideal for a rifle or a long gun. Next slide. So in addition to storing your firearm safely, it's actually really important to talk to your child about gun safety, um, you know, whether or not you have a gun in the home. So telling your child that if they ever see a gun to not touch it, to move away from the area and to tell a grown up. Uh, one acronym that was coined by one of our trauma surgeons at Emory is SAFE. So stop playing or, or stop other activities in the area of the firearm. Act as if the gun is loaded at all times and be extremely careful. Find help from a nearby adult, evade the gun and never pick it up or put your finger on the trigger. Next slide. Similar to how you'd ask about pets, allergies, supervision, and other safety issues before your child or teen visits another home, it's important to ask about the presence of firearms in homes of where your child or teen may visit. We know that more than a third of unintentional shootings of children take place in the homes of friends, neighbors, and relatives. That one question could save your child's life. Prior to dropping off your child or teen, we recommend asking about the presence of firearms in the home and how they are stored. Doing this beforehand gives you the opportunity to figure out if you're comfortable with the responses that you get and then to also suggest potentially to having the kids playing at your own home um, if you're uncomfortable. Next slide. So I put this up here more for like a reference. Um, often, you know, when I talk to families um, and caregivers about asking about guns in the home before their child goes to play. They've wanted to know like, what's the best way to do this? This is a super awkward question. You may be like, an, like a new play date, you may not know the parents and then you're like dropping your kid off and then asking about guns. Um, so that can be challenging. And there's multiple ways to do it. I would just recommend doing uh, what's comfortable to you because you're then you're more likely to actually do it. But um, there are a bunch of examples listed on the Be Smart website that was on the prior slide. Um, but some examples could be to put, to put it on your child. So you can say that I have, my son is pretty curious. Our doctor recommended that I ask, is there an unlocked gun where my child plays? You can also try the sandwich technique, asking about other things. So like asking about your other safety concerns. So my child has an allergy to peanuts. Just wanted to make sure there's no peanut related food in the area um, where they're going to be playing or eating. Also, do you own any firearms and how are they stored? Um, you guys be playing video games, you know, we, we set restrictions. And then for future reference, I don't have any firearms in my home. Um, thanks so much. And so you can modify that, you know, to however you want. And then really if the older child, um, if you have a teenager that's babysitting, they could take ownership um, when they're contacting the family and texting them about what their responsibilities are, can also say that their parents want to know if there's an unsecured firearm in the home. I um, recently had a colleague that said that you know, now that the, they've sort of started play dates, um, hoping that, you know, these pande pandemic numbers are getting better, um, that their six year old was on a play date for the first time and they had house rules um, where they told their child and they had recently talked to their child about safety around guns um, and basically said that you're going to this house. You know, our rules are the child was allergic to fish, so no fish, no power tools, and no weapons. And when they got dropped off, um, the dad had the daughter repeat the house rules. And then the parent that, the, that was there that they were dropping off the child um, to their home, you know, laughed and was actually amused. Um, and, then, and then automatically offered, you know, we actually don't have any uh, guns in our home, but we do have power tools and we'll keep them far away. Next slide. You can also refer to our children's website for any additional firearm safety material um, and messaging that can be um, used as a reference and also shared with other families. I'm gonna pass it back over to Manisha. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sophia.
So now we're gonna go to our next topic, which is child passenger safety. And as I mentioned before, motor vehicle crashes are a leading cause of death and injury for children that are seen at Maryland Elementary. But we have to remember for each child killed in a car crash, there are 18 more that are hospitalized and another 400 that require medical treatment. And oops, let's make sure this is going. And the reality is, as car seats and booster seats work, we know from extensive research that car seats reduce the risk of injury by about 80% and booster seats reduce the risk of injury by about 50%. Um, we have had car seats and booster seats around for several decades. The first child safety laws were enacted in the late 70s in Tennessee, and every state, including Georgia, had some law on the books by the mid 80s. The issue is that misuse of car seats and booster seats in seatbelts, it's common and it's really dangerous. Studies reveal that misuse rates range from 70 to 90%. So I would hypothesize that there's some, probably some parents in our Maryland community that might be unwittingly making some errors. And typically the most common error we see is regarding installation of the actual car seat into the vehicle. Um, people will typically will see people who install the car seat a little bit too loosely into the car. So when your car seat is installed, it should not move more than an inch in any direction at the base of the car seat where it comes into contact with the vehicle seat. We'll also sometimes see people who try to use both the lower anchors and tethers attachment system and seat belt at the same time, which is improper, you use one or the other, or they'll fail to use the top tether altogether once the child's in a forward facing car seat or in a booster seat. Another issue we sometimes encounter are families using old or expired car seats. Um, the way car seats are designed to work are they are supposed to help absorb some of that kinetic energy when you are in a car crash um, and that is based on kind of the internal composition of the plastic and foam within the car seat itself. The problem is those internal components can degrade over time, rendering the car seat or booster seat less effective or completely ineffective. We also sometimes see issues with properly harnessing your child into the actual car seat or booster seat. Um, we might see the harness being too loose or improperly positioned. Um, here in this picture, you can see the child's car seat harness is way too loose. And you can also see that their chest clip is definitely not a chest clip, it's more of a belly clip. Um, and that chest clip really needs to be at the level of the child's armpits. Additionally, we'll sometimes see issues with families putting extra items into the car seat itself or attaching it to the harness. The reality is that anything that does not come with a car seat um, has not been tested for safety and extra items can easily become projectiles if you're in a car crash. And then another major issue we see when it comes to child passenger safety is premature graduation. So you have to remember that every time you take your kid from that rear facing infant car seat to the forward facing car seat, to the booster seat, to the seat belt, you are actually reducing the level of protection they have when they are in a car crash. And I have a picture of a roller coaster ride here to kind of hammer in this point that if you're in a rollover car crash, it's the same kind of mechanics of being in a rollover roller coaster. And think about the kind of harnesses that we're in when we're in a roller coaster that's going upside down or doing you know sideways loops and what have you. Those are pretty serious harnesses. And if we're in a rollover car crash, you kind of would like to have a serious harness like that. So as far as Georgia law, um, our law says that our children need to be in a car seat or booster seat until they turn eight years old. So that means every kindergartner, every first grader, and a good chunk of our second graders need to be in a car seat or booster seat, with the exception of those who are over the height of four feet, nine inches or 57 inches tall, if they can fit properly into a regular seat belt, which we'll go into in a moment. Additionally, Georgia law says that every child needs to be in the back seat until they turn eight. The one caveat is, is if you have, let's say you're doing a carpool and you have three kids sitting in the back seat and you have a fourth child and there's no other place to put them. In that instance, that fourth child could sit in the front seat. That's Georgia law, which is good if you're following the law, but better would be to actually follow the minimum recommendations by the manufacturers for whatever car seat or booster seat you're using. And the best is to actually max out the height or weight and to follow the AAP recommendations. So really delaying that transition to the next step. Because remember, every time you graduate your child to the next step of a child car seat, you're reducing their protection if you're ever in a car crash. 
So what does the AAP or American Academy of Pediatrics actually recommend? Well, it really boils down to five key recommendations. And the first one is to really keep kids, your infants, rear facing as long as possible. This is the safest position for children. Um, and what the reason why is it helps distribute any forces that might be transferred to your child in a car crash all over their body. And it really helps protect their head and their neck and their spinal cord. They make car seats that actually keep kids rear facing until about 40 pounds. And it's actually law in various European countries to keep children rear facing until they're about four years of age. And I know parents sometimes worry about broken legs if the child is rear facing, kind of like the child in the right hand picture. Um, but the reality is, is broken legs heal really, really, really well in kids, but broken heads and necks and C-spines, not so much. The second major recommendation is to keep children in a five-point harnessed car seat or booster seat until they're at least four years old, but really as long as possible to maximize the safety benefit to your child. So this should really be done until your child is at least 40 pounds, but you should know that they actually make car seats that have five point harnesses up to 90 pounds. And in fact, I went and I checked my daughter's car seat. She can actually stay in that car seat until she's 65 pounds and she probably will actually. The next recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics is once you graduate your child from that forward facing car seat is to then make sure your child is in a booster until they're at least eight years of age. Um, and in reality, most kids are probably gonna need to be in a booster seat until they're a little bit older. Booster seats work by making sure that the seat belt, the shoulder and lap belt portions fit the child properly. The lap portion of the seat belt needs to go across the child's hip and pelvis not their stomach. And the shoulder portion of the seatbelt needs to go across their chest, not across their neck. Typically, children don't fit a seatbelt properly until they're 57 inches tall. Um, and so this is something that we need to think about. There might be eight-year-olds who are now in regular seatbelts, but they may not actually be fitting them properly. And that puts these children at risk for injury. So how do you actually know if your child's ready to graduate to a regular seat belt with the lap and shoulder belt component and be out of the booster? Well, there are five things that your child needs to meet. So first of all, your child needs to be able to sit with their back against the, seat, the vehicle seat. Second of all, their knees have to bend at the edge of the seat because what we'll sometimes see is if their knees don't bend at the edge of the seat, if they're a little too short, the child will start slouching forward um, and when they slouch forward, that lap portion of the seatbelt starts going up against the belly and the shoulder portion of the seatbelt starts to go across their neck, which is dangerous. Third, again, the lap belt needs to fit on the top of the thighs and on the pelvis and not over the belly. And fourth, the shoulder belt needs to be between the neck and the shoulder. Finally, your child needs to be able to sit properly and use the seatbelt properly. They can't be putting the shoulder strap behind their back to be more comfortable. They can't be fidgeting with the seatbelt the whole time. And so some kids may fit, but they may not be mature enough to really sit properly in a car seat. The fourth recommendation from the AAP is to make sure your child um, uses a lap and shoulder belt at all times once they're old enough and big enough to be in that sort of restraint. Um, consistent lap and shoulder belt use reduces the risk of injury by 40% compared to children who are completely unrestrained if they're in a car crash. The final recommendation is for children to stay in the back seat until they're at least 13 years of age. And I know this is probably going to be horribly unpopular with some of our kids. Um, I literally just had this discussion with my daughter as I was driving her to school today. Um, and I definitely remember being a kid myself in the 80s and my father would pick me up and I was in the front seat of his little Honda Civic from the age of four and I was so short I couldn't even look out the, any of the windows. We just didn't know better but we know better now. We have more information. And the reality is, is your child sitting in the back seat reduces their risk of injury if they're in a car crash by about 60%. So no matter how badly your kid wants to sit in the front seat and be your co-pilot, the safest thing for them to do is to be in the back seat. Now, what I'll say is that car seat installation can be a little bit tricky. So if you ever need help, there are some amazing people in this world called child passenger safety technicians or CPSTs. 
these techs are extensively trained on the installation of car seats and their proper use of car seats and booster seats. They literally take a 40 hour course and then have to recertify every two years. Um, they know what they are doing. And you can find a child passenger safety technician by going to the website that I listed, um, but you can also find it by just searching. Um, the National Highway um, Traffic Safety Administration is another really great resource as a safe kids for finding a good child passenger safety technician. When you go, it's important to not only have your car seat or booster seat, but it's also really helpful to have your child with you so they can actually help you optimize how you're putting your child in the harness or the safety restraint. Um, I know sometimes people say, oh, just go to your local fire station or police department. And I love our first responders. They are absolutely amazing. And they always, always, always want to help. Um, but the reality is, is that not every fire station or police station has a child passenger safety technician. So they might help you, but they may not have that education and training to actually make sure your kid is the safest they can be when they are traveling in your vehicle. So moving on to our next topic and last topic, it is on helmets. And I think most of us think about helmets in the context of bicycling, but we have to remember that helmets do play a role in other activities like horseback riding, snow sports, um, skateboarding, scootering, rollerblading, et cetera. The reality is, is that every year there are over 26,000 children who end up in an emergency department after suffering a head injury while being on a bicycle. And this is separate of the kids that we see in the ED who fall and get a broken arm or have a laceration that we need to sew up. But there are significant contributions from those other activities that I mentioned. In total, there are about 42,000 children who end up in the ED for sustaining a head injury while participating in a sport or an activity where helmet use is recommended. The issue is that helmet use in children, consistent helmet use, isn't always great. When it comes to bicycling in particular, studies estimate that children consistently wear their helmets about 40% of the time. And for the other activities we mentioned, it can range as low as 20% to as high as 70%, depending on the activity. The thing is, we know that helmets work. Um, helmet efficacy has been most thoroughly studied in the context of bicycling. And depending on the study that you look at, helmets have been shown to reduce the risk of serious head injury by 60 to 80%. And if your child does sustain a head injury, helmets have been shown to reduce the severity of associated head injury as well. One fact that I use a lot to motivate my social media, you know, Instagram, TikTok teens into wearing helmets is that helmets are also associated with reducing the risk of facial injury by 65%. So these kids who wear helmets and then fall off their bike are less likely to sustain a facial fracture or a significant laceration. And that message seems to be pretty poignant when it comes to um, our social media minded teens. And similarly, efficacy has been proven in some of the other activities that I've already mentioned. So what are some pearls to make sure you're using your helmet properly? Well, first you gotta make sure you're using the right helmet. So for example, you can't really wear your bicycle helmet when you are skiing down the slopes um, in Gatlinburg. Um, you really need to make sure that you're using the right helmet because helmets have different manufacturing criteria or standards that they have to meet. The one caveat is that a bicycle helmet is okay to use for scootering, roller skating, and roller blading. The other thing is, is your child plays a lot of different sports. There are actually multi-sport helmets out there as well that you can consider. We also have to remember that helmets don't last forever and they may need to be replaced from time to time. Um, our children in elementary school can be growing like weeds, so they can outgrow their helmets. That's one major reason why helmets may need to be replaced. And helmets can also be damaged, whether it's in a crash or just the otherwise normal abuse that children have. I've definitely noticed my daughter swinging her helmet around in our garage, hitting things, thinking it's funny. And it's not because it can definitely reduce the um, structural integrity and the protection that the helmet offers her. Additionally, just like car seats expire, helmets expire. Those internal components that are meant to absorb the forces and energy when you fall can degrade over time. And typically manufacturers recommend that they need to be changed every five years, but you should look at the specific helmet in question. Another important point when it comes to helmet use is it's gotta fit properly if it's gonna protect your child. One study show that less than 10% of children actually had their helmet adjusted and fitting properly. So how do you make sure your kid's helmet fits properly? Well, first, this is my daughter. Your helmet needs to sit low on their forehead. 
um, usually less than a few finger breaths above their eyebrows, and it needs to sit level and parallel to the ground. That helmet needs to fit snugly, so you may need to adjust some of the internal components to make sure when your child is dancing like my child likes to do or shaking their head yes or no, that that helmet's not wiggling and it's not sliding forward over into their line of sight. As far as the straps, it needs to be fairly snug. And a good rule of thumb is that that chin strap should really only allow two fingers between the chin itself and the strap. And this does take some getting used to and definitely something I frequently argue with my daughter about like, hey, sorry, you gotta wear your helmet and you gotta wear it properly and I'm not loosening up that chin strap because that is how it keeps you safe. And then you also want your helmet to make a Y over each ear as you can see in the side view. The other thing to think about is your child, if they're like mine, who has super long hair, may need to have their hairstyle adjusted. Um, and so some families, when they're going on trips, may actually have to think about what they're putting their kid in um, hairstyle wise, if they're gonna be doing a lot of cycling, for example. Now, this is all great and good. We can know our kids need to wear helmets, but how do you actually get them to wear the helmets? Um, I definitely know some friends whose kids say, yeah, 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 I'll wear my helmet. And then they just go outside and get on their scooter. No helmet at all, even though the parents have told them time and time and time again. So one of the big things you can do is to try and allow choice um, when it comes to the helmet. So let your kid pick out what helmet they want. My daughter loves Frozen, so she has a Frozen helmet. Um, another thing you can do is you can have your child decorate their helmet with stickers so it looks cool to them. And that can be very motivating for your child to consistently wear their helmet. You also need to be a role model. Research shows that adult helmet wearing has been associated with improved helmet use by children. In one study, adults who always wore helmets when they're cycling had kids who wore their helmets 90% of the time. This fell to less than 40% for kids of adults who did not consistently wear their helmets. It's kind of like telling your kids, you don't smoke, but if you're smoking yourself, that message isn't very effective. It is the same thing with helmets. I also think it's important to remind your kids that your rules, including wearing helmets, apply everywhere. I frequently encounter children in our emergency department who get injured while riding bikes, scooters, and other wheel devices when visiting their friend's home or neighbor's home or family member's home. And they said, well, it's not my bike. I just got it on for a second. Well, it doesn't matter. If they fall off and they're not wearing a helmet, they can still get injured. And finally, you can remind your child that it is actually the law that they wear their helmet here in Georgia. Georgia law requires helmets for children under the age of 16. So with that, we're wrapping up our talk and we wanna leave time for questions. If you want more resources, we highly recommend that you go to the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta Strong for Life website. It's where we house all sorts of information related to resiliency, nutrition, parenting, but also injury prevention. Um, and there are some specific links listed here on this slide that might be interesting to you if you have more questions about how do you keep your child safe in a car seat or safe around firearms. Um, the other thing is Strong for Life has a really, really great Instagram. So if you are interested in following Instagram, I highly recommend you follow it. They have usually some new content every single day related to one of the topics that I mentioned, not just injury prevention. And I really do think it is a great resource for parents. Um, and with that, uh, Dr. Chaudhary and I are happy to take questions. Katrina, you are on mute, so we cannot hear you. Let's do that again. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Every single section that, that you hit on just had stats that were mind blowing. Um, we do have one question in the chat. We have addressed that a little bit, but I think this is really, this hits our community right now because every single one of it is that transition period that you mentioned. So the question was, I have a very large child for his age. Is it better to try to keep him in the car seat or a high back booster, even if he is large enough for just a booster? It's absolutely best to keep your child in a car seat or high back booster for as long as possible. We know that each transition is reducing the amount of safety that your child has in the event that you are in a car crash. So um, if you have any concerns about how the item is fitting, again, going to a child passenger safety technician is absolutely your best resource. They can check how your child is fitting. Sometimes they even have recommendations of products that might be helpful. Um, I believe the NHTSA website also has a really great resource where you can actually put in your child's size, um, their height, their weight, and they can help actually recommend 
um, appropriate child safety restraint devices for your child. Great. And then we have another one regarding the helmets. And I have something I'd like to add to that as well. Uh, regarding price points for helmets, does that matter? Um, and then to piggyback off that, used helmets, such as hand-me-downs from, from siblings um, within the five years. But, but how does that affect helmet use? So price point for helmets, it really doesn't matter as far as I've seen. There's no evidence that a specific helmet is better than the other. There is some new bicycle helmet technology that's coming out. So things like the NIPS technology, um, and then there's, a, I can't say it's like the Hovslick. There's multiple technologies out there, all thought to help reduce the risk of concussion and head injury. But there's not a lot of, they're all um, lab tests with these helmets so far, there isn't any real world evidence or studies documenting their efficacy. So it's really, your child needs to be in a helmet. If you wanna spring for more for like a MIPS helmet or something fancy like that, um, it's really up to you, but just know that it's not necessarily evidence-based at this time. Now, as far as the used helmet question, we typically don't recommend used helmets. I think a caveat would be is if it's your own older child's helmet going to your younger child within that five-year time frame. If it's your own child, in theory, you know if that helmet's been involved in a crash um, or if that child has been abusive to that helmet, right? Um, and that it might be okay to recycle that helmet. And I do have a younger daughter. Um, I think the reality is, is the age gap is big enough between my two girls that I will probably still have to buy a new helmet for the youngest one when she's ready to get on wheeled devices. Um, but if they were closer together in age, um, where I thought that the helmet may not have expired by then, then I would consider using it just because I know what my daughter has done with her helmet already. And I trust myself. So. That's excellent. Because actually, as, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm picturing that one helmet I have that I probably just need to get rid of. Like it has that, it's had yeah. some, been rough thrown around here and there. So yeah. Happy. That's what kids do, right? That's what they do. And they're good at it. Yeah. Yeah. That is all I have right now. Um, as I've mentioned before, we're actually going to, this will be posted and recorded so anyone can watch it later on. If there are any questions, I know at the last slide, you showed us some places we can go to to get those as well. So um, I want to thank both of you because I know your schedule. I, I can't imagine what it's like with your schedule, but I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to our community about this because these are things that I think, especially with the car seats, um, you know, we, we have the babies and they grow up and we think we have it under control, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm already thinking I have to go out to the car right now and we do our car seat, so. Yeah, yeah it's really, really, really important. And I, I do think it impacts our Maryland community. I definitely do see some of our first graders climbing into front seats. And I definitely have been in that carpool lane when you're picking up your kid and heard cars like honking their horns, like it's going. And yeah, we want the line, lane to move, but we want our kids to be harnessed and appropriately before we zoom off. I mean, it's really important. And let's face it, Candler Park Drive can be a little bit crazy. And I don't think there'll be a high speed crash there, but there definitely can be fender benders. Um, and I would encourage anyone who has any questions to reach out to Dr. Chaudhary or me. We're very passionate about this topic. Um, this is our, this is what we do when we're not in the emergency department. We want to keep kids safe. We want to put ourselves as much out of business as possible. Um, I love seeing all of our kids and our parents in the community, but I don't want to see you in my ED. I will if you're there, but I don't want to see you there. I want to see you when we do drop off and pick up and at school events. Right. Well, thank you so much. And also, you know, thank you to everyone who's been watching. We have not only the Mary Lynn community, but I believe uh, Morningside and Spark and Hope Hill as well. We have some people joining us from, from those communities. So thank you very much. And uh, we really appreciate it. This is helpful. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much.